This episode is sponsored by Bark, the best parental control monitoring app around. A listener note, this podcast deals with adult topics and is not suitable for young listeners. In 2008, females ages 12 and older experienced about 552,000 non-fatal violent victimizations, including rape, sexual assault, and aggravated or simple assault by an intimate partner, compared to 101,000 non-fatal violent victimizations for men. In 2007, intimate partners committed 14% of all homicides in the U.S., In today's episode, I'm sharing the tragic story of Emily Lambert, a single mom who went missing on a weekend trip to New Mexico with her boyfriend. I'm Brooke Wilkerson. This is The Murder Podcast, and this is her story. Before we get started, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has listened, subscribed, and left a review. This podcast has been a dream of mine for a while now, and it's only possible with the support of you all. If you are left wanting more, then you will love the Patreon fan club, where you'll get early access to ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and more. You can check it out at themurderpodcast.com and click on fan club. Now back to the show. Emily Lambert was a 30-year-old elementary teacher in a Dallas, Texas suburb of Garland and a mother of two girls ages four and five. Friends and family described her as a dynamic woman of intense passion who wanted to be everyone's friend and fix any problems that they had. Emily loved traveling, pool, and skiing. Although they had divorced, Emily and her ex-husband, Donovan Lambert, remained friends and were honestly like, Hashtag goals for co-parenting. The two had divorced in September of 2013, but made the conscious decision to live on the same street in order to be close to their daughters. Donovan said that Emily brought light to everybody everywhere she went and that she never met a stranger. He described her as a wonderful mother and devoted teacher. Donovan had actually just been featured on a hidden camera show in November where he stood up for a lesbian couple that was being harassed. Emily shared the link to the show on her Facebook page and said, quote, I am thankful my daughters have a man like this as their father. Thank you, Donovan, for being an example they can be proud of. Her family and friends describe her as loving and nurturing, saying that she was a one of a kind person. And by posts shared on her memorial page, they weren't lying. One post has a picture of Emily changing the brake pads and oil in her car in a miniskirt. If that doesn't sum up who she was, then I don't know what will. She was currently in her first year of teaching math and science to third graders. One of her students' parents said that Emily communicated with them often. In fact, the Friday before Emily's death, she had told a parent that she loved seeing her son smile every day and that she wanted to do all she could to help him be successful. She was the kind of teacher we'd all want to teach our kids. Shortly after her divorce, Emily began dating a man named Robert Early. Robert was 33 years old and worked in the oil industry, which required some traveling. The two had been dating for about four months, and they related a lot as they were both single parents. Emily's ex-husband Donovan said that he had actually met Robert a few times and that he always seemed genuine, cordial, happy, and friendly. He told reporters that he was actually okay with him. But everything changes in March of 2014 while on a weekend visit with Robert in New Mexico. Emily goes missing. Robert was working on an oil field there and Emily had traveled there to spend some time with him that weekend. On Saturday, March 1st, the two checked into a Best Western and they spent the day together sightseeing and shopping and ended up at the Blue Cactus Bar that night. The next morning, Robert called Emily's parents to tell them that she had stormed off after an argument and didn't come back. He told her dad that she walked out around midnight and that he'd been up pacing the floor since 5 a.m. waiting for her to return, but she hadn't. 
Emily's parents had met Robert before and said they didn't have any reason to believe that he was lying. So when he called them and told them she was missing, they told him to call the police and report her missing, which he did. Emily was last seen leaving the bar in Carlsbad around 11.30 p.m. Video footage showed her leaving the bar alone and Robert leaving shortly after. Robert told police the same thing that he told her parents, that they had had an argument and that Emily got so mad at him that she stormed out of their room and didn't come back. She had left behind her wallet and her cell phone. Several law enforcement agencies began conducting searches in the area trying to find Emily. In the meantime, Robert consented to a search of his vehicle and appeared to be cooperating with police. He even agreed to take a polygraph, but he failed. After he learned that he had failed his polygraph, he changed his story. Several times, actually. In another version of events, he told police that when he got back to the room, that Emily was sitting in her car. He said that he went inside the room, and when he came back out, she was getting into a truck with a, quote, big guy wearing a light-colored cowboy hat. He said that he followed the truck, and the driver eventually pulled over. The unknown man driving the truck got out, and the two began to fight. Robert said that the man tried to hit him with a pipe, but Emily had jumped between them, trying to break them up, and the pipe hit Emily instead, knocking her out. He said that they both fled the scene, leaving Emily behind. After his confession, he then led police to Emily's body, about 11 miles away, sticking with this story involving the unknown man. When police found Emily, she was only wearing a bra, nothing else, and was lying face down. After being interrogated yet again, Robert eventually confessed and told authorities what really happened. There wasn't another man involved. She didn't storm out of the room. She didn't get into a stranger's truck. Robert said that it was true they had gotten into an argument. He said that it all started when someone made a pass at her at the bar, which made Robert mad. They start to argue in the bar and Emily leaves. When Robert got back to the room, the argument continued, and Emily ends up telling Robert that she's breaking up with him. The argument then turned physical, with Emily biting Robert at one point. He told police that after she bit him, he started hitting her and kicking her in the mouth until she was unconscious, but still breathing. But he didn't stop there. He then loaded her into his car and drove to a remote area. Emily regains consciousness, and Robert admits to knocking her out again with an air pump that he had in his car. He then made a noose out of a rope and tied one end of it around her neck and the other end to his car. He got back into the car and began driving, dragging Emily behind his car to the spot where her body was later found. After he stopped, he then hit her with a bar a couple of times to, quote, ensure that she would not suffer or freeze to death. On his way back to the room, he disposed of the bar and the air pump. Robert told police that he went back the next morning to see if she was still alive, but that he found her dead, so he got rid of the rope in order to, quote, cover his tracks. After his truthful confession, Robert led detectives to the locations where he had gotten rid of the bar, the rope, and the air pump. An autopsy later showed that Emily suffered severe blunt trauma to her head, along with extensive scrapes, bruises, and tears. They were able to determine that Emily was alive at the time the noose was placed around her neck. So much for her not suffering. Being a mom and a true crime fanatic, I'm always super vigilant about my kids' safety, and that includes keeping them safe on their devices. That's why I love the Bark app, the best parental control monitoring app around. Bark connects to up to 24 platforms to monitor text messages, emails, and social activity for signs of harmful interactions and content. When Bark detects a potential risk, you get an email and a text so that you don't have to comb through every post and message on your kid's device. It's a research-backed and kid-friendly solution for safeguarding your family. It's also super affordable, and you can try it free for seven days at bark.us. Bark is also offering a giveaway for TMP listeners. Three winners will be chosen to receive a lifetime subscription to Bark. To enter, go to the Murder Podcast Facebook page and comment hashtag Bark giveaway on today's episode post. Winners will be notified by March 15th. 
and be sure to check it out at bark.us. Robert was arrested and held on a million dollar bond. He was charged with first degree murder, tampering with evidence, and kidnapping. Of course, his lawyers argued that the statements that he gave to the police shouldn't be allowed into evidence, and Robert pleaded not guilty. But the court decided against his lawyers and allowed those statements into evidence. Robert's defense asked the jury to consider second-degree murder instead of first-degree, stating that Robert was too drunk to plan Emily's murder or fully understand the consequences of his actions that night. But the jury did not, and Robert Early was convicted of first-degree murder, aggravated kidnapping, and tampering with physical evidence in May of 2015, which carried an automatic life sentence by law. The death penalty is not available in New Mexico. One of the alternate jurors told reporters that, even though she didn't deliberate on the verdict, that sitting through the testimony and evidence in the case was the most difficult thing she'd ever done. The alternate jurors were sent home on Thursday after closing arguments, but she said that she came back on Friday anyway, just to see it through. She said she felt like justice had been served. Other jurors also spoke out, agreeing with her that the most difficult part was seeing the crime scene and autopsy photos and seeing Emily's family in the courtroom every day. Robert spoke to the courtroom saying, quote, the guilt and pain I've had since that night has been a living nightmare. He asked for forgiveness from Emily's family, but said that he didn't expect them to forgive him. He told him that he would change places with Emily if he could. I find this surprising since Robert then appealed the court's decision, again stating that his confession shouldn't have been allowed. So Emily's family is supposed to believe that he was so sorry and that he would trade places with Emily, who suffered tremendously before she died, but he wasn't willing to sit in jail for murdering her? He decided to appeal his conviction on several ridiculous reasons. In his appeal, Robert's defense argued a few different reasons why his conviction should be overturned. One was that his confession should have been suppressed, stating that they were unlawfully obtained since he was under the influence of alcohol at the time. He stated that when he waived his Miranda rights prior to his polygraph exam, that he was sobering up after four days of continuous drinking. But police are adamant that he didn't appear to be under the influence during their interrogations. Then, he claimed that the omission of certain crime scene and autopsy photos were, quote, redundant and irrelevant, and should have been excluded because those photos unfairly caused prejudice against Robert. Again, photos of the crime that he committed unfairly caused prejudice against him? Of course they would cause prejudice. It's proof of how he murdered her. Another argument in his appeal was that the limitation of the testimony from their pharmacology expert. During his trial, the defense had Dr. Rivera testify that because of Robert's voluntary intoxication, that he couldn't have had the intent required for a first-degree murder charge. The day before trial, the prosecution filed a motion to exclude Dr. Rivera's testimony, stating that Dr. Rivera's opinions were based on assumptions and insufficient facts. The trial court ended up limiting Dr. Rivera's testimony, which the appeal stated was unjust. Also in this appeal, the defense argued that the exclusion of Robert's mom's testimony was wrong. Apparently, Robert's defense had planned to have his mom, Donna, testified that Emily had told her that her and her ex-husband had frequent domestic issues that turned physical and that she was, quote, proud of putting him down on the ground. Basically, they were going to use some good old-fashioned victim blaming. This was not admissible because it was considered hearsay, and I highly doubt a jury would have cared about that anyway. In 2016, the state's high court affirmed his 2014 conviction and denied his appeal. Emily's family will not have to endure any more appeals, and Robert has no possibility for parole. Justice was served. If you're enjoying this podcast and want to hear more full-length episodes, mini episodes, and more, then check out the Murder Podcast Patreon fan club. Not only will you be getting bonus content, but a portion of the proceeds will be donated to the National Domestic Violence Hotline. 
Check it out at patreon.com slash the murder podcast. And I'll also link it in the show notes. Emily's daughters are now in the care of her ex-husband, Donovan. Her family talks about Emily to her daughters every day to help keep her spirit alive. Her mother, Donna Koenig, spoke to the courtroom for five minutes after Robert was sentenced. She said that Emily was the brightest light in her life and that they'll all miss the fire and intensity that Emily brought to any occasion. What's even more tragic about Emily's story is that this is her parents' second time losing a grown child. In 2009, Emily's older brother Daniel was killed in a car accident, something that absolutely devastated Emily and her parents. Emily's family has set up a fund to support her two young daughters. Donations can be made at any Wells Fargo bank to the Remembering Emily Lambert Memorial Fund. They have also created a memorial Facebook page, which I'll link in the show notes. They share updates on Emily's daughters and how they're keeping Emily's spirit alive, along with tons of pictures. In 2015, Emily's best friend gave birth to a baby boy and named him Emerson in memory of Emily. If you or someone you know is a victim of domestic violence, please contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or online at thehotline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. You can find all of the show notes and more information about this podcast at themurderpodcast.com. That's the murder, M-H-E-R-D-E-R, podcast.com. Hey guys, I want to let you know that I'm working on a special Q&A episode for season one, and I'd love to get your questions about any of the episodes I've covered in this season. To submit a question, you can write to me on the Murder Podcast Facebook page or Instagram, or you can call and leave your question on our voicemail at 931-244-1118. Again, that's 931-244-1118, and who knows, you might hear yourself on the Q&A episode of the Murder Podcast.